Good morning, Good Shepherd. Good morning. I know you're out there. It's nice to be able to greet you, not out in front of the church as I do sometimes, but here inside the church this morning to share with you God's word from his holy book that we've been studying. In that series, that wonderful series that Pastor Marty has been doing called By the Book. And if you recall, in that process, he made us aware that we weren't just dealing with one book, the Bible, but a whole library of books, 66 of them in fact, and inside of them were all kinds of different writings and literature, styles of literature, that there was geography and history and romance and, and uh, heroic tales and devotional material and advice on how to live our Christian lives. And in that special book of the Old Testament called Proverbs, Solomon gives us all those pithy sayings about the wisdom that God wants us to know. Well, this morning, Pastor Marty has allowed me to take a look at one of those books, one of the great letters of the Old Testament written by St. Paul, who wrote almost a fourth of the New Testament called 1 Thessalonians. It's a special book an important book in our lives. And it's a whole book. So buckle your seatbelts. We may be here a while. In his series, Pastor Marty alluded to the fact that these books are each individual in their own way. And in every library, there's always a section that fascinates me. It used to be called science fiction, but now it's changed to futuristic literature. It came about years ago in my childhood when we were talking about uh, uh, people like Jules Verne and his, his atomic submarine, or talking about the Jetsons flitting around in the air, going everywhere. Remember that? Some of you are too young for that, I know, you know. But, but there's the Star Wars, right? And Star Trek. And today, Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> Fascinating things in there. Things that we never thought were possible. Whoever thought, when I was watching the Jetson in the old days, and they would flick a switch on their phone, that pictures would come across that phone, and they could talk face-to-face -face with people. <laughs> Welcome, folks, to Skype and FaceTime and WhatsApp. Or when they came up with those laser guns that I wanted in my youth. And today, those laser guns are being used to operate on the eye and other parts of the body in a very useful way. What a transition into the present. And those days, whenever um, they reveal those things, they didn't become so much a part of the future anymore. Now they're happening so fast, they're here almost today. Everything predicted in the future seems to rush in on us, except one thing. One thing. One thing that gives people problems. Some people believe that it's utter nonsense, foolishness, and that's when the Lord talks about his second coming into the world. Some people have trouble with that because, you see, every day that goes by, it seems like, well, that's not going to happen. I mean, if there's going to be an end to the world, then probably it will be a nuclear holocaust or some kind of a, uh, environmental suicide situation that we pull off on ourselves. But, but not, not the Lord's coming. And yet today, in that portion that I'm going to be focusing on especially, in 1 Thessalonians 4, this is what he says in the 16th verse. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. See, it's not going to be happening just naturally. It's God stepping into history, stepping into his world the way he did in Jesus Christ, and now bringing him again. 
in that final moment, that important moment in the future of our lives. And there will be no mistaking his hand in it. This is the time of the church year when we come around to the end of the year. And the end of the year is on those end times. It's on the eschatology is what it's called in theological language. language. Doctrine about the end times, which occurred and occupy the time all the way from when Jesus ascended into heaven until the time that he returns. And Jesus is coming. Coming in all of his glory to take us back to himself the way we sang this morning. And although David, I mean Daniel, and, and uh, the book of Revelations are often the ones that get credited with having futuristic language in it with all of their visions and symbols that they have, the truth is that it's spread out through many books of the Bible. Just as it is in our gospel set aside for this day that you see on your worship uh, notes, Matthew 25, 1 to 13, where it gives us a picture of Jesus' coming back as a bridegroom this time, and there are ten virgins waiting for him, five wise and five foolish, five who have brought oil with them and five who didn't. And when they fell asleep, suddenly while they're asleep, the bridegroom returns, and those who have oil go in with him to celebrate the banquet, and those who don't are left at a loss. That's eschatology. That's end time stuff. And yet our God, whom we know so importantly as a God of the present, with us every day, here and now, also wants us to live life with the future in mind. I know he's all about the present, but he's all about the future too. The life he's given us in this world is for a single purpose, to prepare us for the future with him in heaven. It's a grace period he gives us in order to deepen our faith and to grow in our commitment to him and to be a part of what he's doing here to bring as many people with us as possible into that. Paul, in his, God, in his epistle, and God focuses on the future, especially when the present world becomes difficult to bear. You've heard the phrase, I'm sure, in our world today, live in the moment. Sounds really good, doesn't it? It's really good when life is going well. Really good when you're enjoying the moment. But what happens when the moment stinks? What happens when you've got a problem in your life that's overwhelming, like losing your job? like losing a loved one, like losing a relationship, then the present moment doesn't seem so exciting. I think there are families and friends of 26 people in Southern Springs who don't think the present is exciting right now. I think there are families in Texas, in Port Lavaca, in Houston, in Beaumont, in Florida, in Puerto Rico, who don't think the present moment is great right now. It's difficult times for them as they try to recover from the blows that have taken over their lives. And so when that happens, God holds out the future to them to get them through. When Israel was taken into captivity in the Old Testament, and lived in slavery in Egypt, God held out to them through Moses the promise of a land flowing with milk and honey, that he would lead them out through the wilderness until they came to that place that God had prepared for them where he would bless them abundantly. They lived for that day. When God's people were taken captive, by the Assyrians and the Babylonians in the Old Testament. God again held out to them the future, a future where there would be a return to Jerusalem, a rebuilding of the temple, and even through the prophets, a prophesy about the future coming of a special person, 
a Messiah, the Christ who would come to save them. Such is the case when God speaks through St. Paul in his letter to the church at Thessalonica. Let me give you a little history and geography this morning as we go. It was a very special city named after the half-sister of Alexander the Great, Thessalonica. A very prosperous city of some 200,000 people in these days, and it laid on a very important trade route called the Via Ignatio. It was a Roman road built by the Romans from Rome all the way to Constantinople, 696 miles, and people were flowing back and forth constantly. Now, Paul had just come out of Philippi. And in Philippi, he had done some good things, but there was also some bad things that happened. He was beaten, he was imprisoned, and finally he was ushered to the city limits by the city officials and said, take off, Buster, we don't want you around anymore. You're a rabble rouser. And so he went down the road to Thessalonica. And I'm sure coming, he must have had a lot of hope himself about what was going to happen in Thessalonica. It was such a crucial location. From there, he could put down roots for his ministry. From there, he could launch out his mission projects in two directions, one to Asia, one to Europe. It was a great place to be. And he came in, I'm sure, with a great deal of hope. And he was pretty successful. He converted some of the Jewish people in the synagogue. He converted some of the God-fearing Greek men. And also, the Bible says in Acts chapter 17, some very prominent women in the community. Things were going well. But then problems came up. A jealous group of Jewish leaders in the synagogue decided it was time to stop their preaching. So they went out into the marketplace, literally, gathered some thugs, paid them to be a part of inst instigating a riot. And they did. And they went looking for Silas and Paul, who were preaching in the city. They went to the house where he was staying, one of the converts named Jason. And the converts, knowing they were coming, had already hidden Paul and Silas away. But that didn't save Jason and his household. This cantankerous bunch of people took them before the city officials, accused them of stirring up problems, of proclaiming the news that there was a different king other than Caesar, and that immediately triggered the Roman people who were in charge. And so they examined Jason and his family very carefully, did not find them innocent, but let them off because they paid a large bond to be set free. Now all this time, Paul and Silas had been sleeping, hidden, waiting for the moment. And as soon as darkness came, they slipped out of the city and headed to Berea. Now, I suspect that as they left, he did not have a good feeling. He wasn't the type of person to just leave behind new Christians without support. He was worried about the opposition that they were facing. And it proved to be even more serious than he had anticipated because the same bunch of jealous Jewish leaders, when they found out he was preaching in Berea, came there to give him trouble, to squelch the gospel. And so he had to again leave and go to Athens. But before he left, he left Timothy behind. And then later on from Athens, asked Timothy to go back and check on these new converts in the city of Thessalonica to see how they were doing under persecution. When Timothy finally brings news, St. Paul is in Corinth. And he gets the good news that things are going well back there. That the church is prospering in spite of the persecution. 
And that's when he sits down to, read, to write this very, very important letter of First Thessalonians. It is an important letter because it also focuses on the importance of knowing Christ is coming. In five different places in this particular book, excuse me, six different places in this particular book, as if to sum up a part of the book, he adds the refrain, Christ is coming again. Jesus is on his way back. I'm going to put, I hope they're going to put up a list of those passages out of 1 Thessalonians. This is what it looks like. And when it comes up, you might want to copy these down for future reference. But it starts by saying, your faith is at work, your love is showing, you are persevering. Keep persevering. The Lord is coming to your rescue. That's chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. And then faith that is a model for Christians is something he applauds in them. People have heard how they have believed, how they have loved, how they have persevered, and they are taking that as an example for themselves in surrounding communities and churches. And so Paul says to them, keep that up, because Jesus will recognize it when he comes back again. That's chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. And then he goes on and says, and try to live a life that reflects your faith. Now, one of the problems in, in the city of Thessalonica among the congregation there is that many of them figured, well, if the Lord's coming, as Paul said, then let's just sit around and wait. I'm sure he'll be here shortly. And so they gave up their jobs. And Paul says, don't give up your J job. It's something you need to keep doing because it's an example to others about how we are to live our lives productively, how we are to provide for our family and have something to help others with. It's a great thing to do. And so Jesus says, or Paul says, Jesus is coming on that faith of yours to perfect it. That's chapter 3, verse 13. And then there were people who were concerned about their loved ones who had died. Concerned in the city of Thessalonica among the Christian community. And so Paul says, don't worry. Jesus is coming to resurrect. And that's chapter 4, verses 13 and 18. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And lastly, he says, now try to live as special people. People of the light, not people of the darkness. Jesus is coming to sanctify you. That's chapter 5, verses 1 through 17 and 23 through 24. Now, I suppose that completes the book, and I should say amen, but you know pastors don't do that. Because <laughs> we always have more to say. And so it's important for us to know that knowing there is a future gives us hope. It's important. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 in the Old Testament is one of the favorite passages of mine. I'm sure it is of Pastor Marty and other people. For it says there, I know the plan I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. And you see, those two words together are important. They are called a Hebraism, which means one helps to explain the other. When do you have hope? When you know there is a future. When you're not stuck in the present. When you know that no, bad, no, bad how, no matter how bad it is, it's going to get better. And so it's important that we have that held out to us by pointing to the future. God was saying to us, you can get through the present, no matter how difficult it is. So God helps us, even to grieve for people whom we have lost in the time that remains, but differently from the way many people grieve. 
Listen to the words of Paul again in 1, Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians 4 at verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Like the rest of men who have no hope. We've often had discussions among pastors at conferences about how difficult it is and how hard it is to see when we have to minister to people who don't know Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. What do you say to them when they lose a loved one? You obviously were going to share Jesus Christ with them, but other people around them don't have that future hope to share with them sometimes. They don't believe in Jesus either. So all they have to offer is, well, let's talk about the memories we had while Jim was here. Let's, let's focus on the things that, that he did productively in his life. Let's really give a glowing, a glowing obituary so that everybody will know what a wonderful person he was. Didn't we just confess our sins a while ago? and need God's forgiveness to get by it? You see, it's a whole different situation because when Timothy brings them this good news about Thessalonica still being alive and well in the church, St. Paul wants to give them hope for the future. And he wants them to know that those who have died in the Lord will not be forgotten Listen to the rest of the epistle in chapter 4. According to the Lord's own word, we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. And according to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Did you get that? That's good news. Good news for them. Because if they lost a loved one to the persecution they were going through, if they were asking the question, if the Lord comes now and claims us, what's going to happen to them? And the good news that God gives them is that Jesus and God will bring them with him from the grave. Lift them up and give them a priority. They come first with him. And then after, we will be caught up with the Lord in the heavens. And we will all go to be with the Lord forever. What a great message. What a great encouragement. Which is what he says to do with that information at the end of this particular chapter. Encourage one another with this. Know that the Lord doesn't forget. If you die in the Lord... Right now, you're not going to miss out on his coming back. He's got you in mind already. He died on the cross and rose again so that you could be sure, as Peter says, you have the sure hope of a resurrection to life. Because he rose, you also will rise. Because he lives, you also will live, even if you die before he returns. What an encouragement that must have been. It gave them a way to grieve with hope. With hope. Please note that Paul didn't say that Christians are to be above grieving. It's part of life. It's a process we go through after we've suffered a loss, whether that loss is the loss of a job or a pet or a a family member or a friend, whatever it happens to be, or our health, we grieve. And psychologist Catherine Sanders, who lost her 17-year-old son, says that it's unfortunate that we went through a period in our country where the model for grieving was Mrs. Kennedy, who mourned the loss of her husband, President Kennedy. Because what picture did she give? A picture of stiff upper lip, being brave, don't shed tears in public, 
keep it all inside. Doesn't work. If you bottle up your feelings like that, it will tear you apart. They need to be expressed and shared. Someone once said, tearless grief bleeds internally. Internally. Even our Lord Jesus wept. You remember that? It was when Lazarus, his friend, died. And I'm sure there are other pastors who would disagree with me. And I agree with them in part when they say that probably he was weeping because the people around this death didn't have enough faith to believe he could do something about it. But I think there was another aspect to it. And that was that he was such a friend to this family, so caring of Mary and Martha, who many times had hosted him in their home, had made him feel comfortable and took care of his physical needs and listened to him share the word of God with them, that when they lost their brother, he genuinely wept with them and with those who mourned Lazarus' loss until he stepped over and by his resurrection power brought him back to life again. Everett Koop, former Surgeon General of the United States, before he was that, was a very good pediatric surgeon. He every day dealt with grieving parents and dying kids. It's a difficult time for him to do that sort of thing, but even more difficult when he found out that his own son had died climbing mountains in the state of New Hampshire. It was really sad for them because they loved him dearly. And so they wanted to share what they were learning from their grief with others. And they sat down to write a tract on grief itself. And they said, our family life will never be the same. And they pled with God prayed fervently to God that every day he would remind them that their son was no longer bothered by this world with this veil of tears we live in, with all of the pain and suffering that goes on. Now he was with the Lord in heaven. And they said, keep reminding us, Lord, of that because it hurts so much here. And he went on to say, in an effort to be comforting, so many Christians say, God will fill the void in your life after someone dies. Instead, we found that the void is never really filled, but that God makes that void bearable by giving you hope of a joyous reunion with those loved ones in heaven, of knowing that they are in a better place even today than we are here today on this earth. How sad for people to grieve without hope. Aren't you glad we're not in that group? We have the hope that is given us through a resurrected Lord. And those who have died in faith in Christ will not be left behind. They will come to be with the Lord on that day when he returns in all of his glory. What a relief. What an encouragement to the Thessalonican Christians. What a relief. What an encouragement to the people of Good Shepherd in Cedar Park. It's the hope God has given us to get us through the tough times, the difficult moments. And in the midst of life's problems, and when enduring the suffering and pain that is surely to impact our human lives, Always take God's advice. Lift life with a mind to the future. Keeping it in mind. Knowing what the Lord has in mind for you. And whenever things get bad, just remind yourself, the Lord is coming soon. And my mother would say, well, when is soon? Actually, I asked her that question. What she said to me, one day sooner than yesterday. <laughs> my wife and I, Kathy, let me tell you, say that again. My wife, Kathy, and I <laughs> drive around our community every once in a while. We pass this Baptist church where there are some pithy statements we really enjoy to read. They're, they're, they're very, you know, Christian, biblical statements, and they kind of lift us up as we go by in the week. One of them this past week as we drove past really caught my eye. 
because it really touched on my message for the day. This is what it said. When we walk with God, the future is always better. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.